I'm Ted Oakley. I'm managing partner at Oxbow Advisors here in Austin, Texas. And uh, this year, uh, as always, our leadoff speaker at our summit has always been David Rosenberg. And David is the most interesting economist that I ever listened to. He's been with us a number of years, and unfortunately, since we can't do it live this year, we've got him here with us today. Just a simple background. Uh, there's a lot to it, but David is president and, uh, and chief economist of his own firm, Rosenberg Research. Prior to that, he was at Gluskin Chef uh, for 10 years, and prior to that, he was at Merrill Lynch in New York. He was a North American economist and uh, knows all the old timers we know over there, Bob Farrell and all that group. So uh, we have a lot in common with knowledge from David. But David, uh, welcome today. Glad to have you. Well, uh, glad to be doing this, Ted, and thanks for inviting me back and hopefully next year in person. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I just want to wish everybody uh, good health and that uh, you're all safe and well. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, from up here in Canada where we're still uh, basically, uh, I wouldn't say quarantine, but taking it slowly. Um, want to wish everybody uh, just uh, good health. Let me ask you, uh, and what, before we get started, a couple of times during this program, everybody, you'll see uh, a, a streamer where if you want to take a 30-day free trial to David's work, uh, you'll, you'll have the information on that. Uh, I would highly encourage it because it's great information. We've used his services for a long time, but I would recommend that. So, David, uh, tell us where we are today. You know, there's a lot of questions out there about, about around where, we're, where we are and where we're going. Right. Well, you know, I, um, I'm going to, uh, I guess, give uh, you and everybody uh, uh, the 30,000 feet up in the air uh, view and try, try and drill it down to also uh, some actionable advice uh, that I think uh, makes sense. Uh, because there's right now, I'm sure a lot of people would agree uh, that there's a lot of things going on that don't make a lot of sense. Um, but my theme uh, for most of this year has been uh, called the Great Repression, uh, and the tagline is uh, business will not be as usual. Uh, and I want to quickly add, Ted, that, you know, in the name of full disclosure, the level of conviction I have in anyone's forecast on the economy uh, or on the markets right now, uh, including my own, is several standard deviations uh, below the norm. Uh, we have a forward multiple on the S&P uh, pressing a two-decade high right now of 22 times. Uh, we have a VIX that continuously presses 25 or 30 on any given day, uh, and a 10-year Treasury note uh, that's yielding uh, 60 basis points. So all I can say is uh, uncertainty reigns. Uh, there are non-confirmations everywhere. And um, look, it's not every day, uh, I can assure you, when equities are hitting highs for the year, uh, at the same time, when you have inversely correlated assets like treasuries and gold uh, performing as well as they have. And um, maybe it's just all a sign uh, of, a, of a gigantic liquidity bubble. Uh, but let's first go to the economy. Uh, looking at what's been built in from all the data, it looks to me like we're looking at at least a 30 percent uh, tailspin for second quarter GDP. Uh, that's already in the markets. And I think we have to remember, though, that this followed a down 5% first quarter for GDP. A lot of people don't talk about that. But, you know, you hear a lot of people say that they can't wait for the economy uh, to get back to the pre-pandemic uh, economy. And I always say, be careful what you wish for, because what we know is that consumers were already pulling in their horns uh, before the government mandated lockdowns in the opening months of the year when people started figuring out what this pandemic really was. Uh, now, the third quarter looks to me that we're going to be up around 15% growth uh, for Q3, the quarter in right now. Uh, but whatever reopening momentum we had uh, is beginning to fade somewhat. So the bottom line here is that there is no V-shaped recovery. It's more like a check mark. Uh, and now we have the outlook for the fourth quarter, I'd say is dubious at best and completely reliant on the extension uh, a fiscal stimulus, uh, keeping in mind that this economy has been and remains uh, on life support. And, you know, unlike the Europeans, which actually had the systems in place, 
the U.S. is scrambling now in the name of preserving social stability to enact these income support mechanisms, you know, beyond just traditional unemployment insurance, welfare, food stamps. I mean, we've come through the most intense tailspoon in the economy since the 1930s. I don't think it's generally appreciated because uh, we're all just gazing at what the markets are doing uh, and looking at the prospect of a third quarter rebound in GDP. You know, year to date, the economy has lost $726 billion in wages and salaries so far this year. But you see, that's been totally overwhelmed by the fact that we've had $2.1 trillion of transfers from the federal government sector to the personal sector, which is why, as unbelievable as this sounds, when you consider that employment is still in the hole to the tune of nearly 15 million jobs, even after the May-June rebound, 15 million jobs in the hole and personal income in the United States in the aggregate so far this year is up, positive, 12% annual rate. At this same juncture in 2019, pre-pandemic, but also pre this massive deficit financed income transfer that's been fully funded off the Fed's balance sheet like magic, that trend was running closer to 4.5%. It's now, even in the context of this deep hole in wages and salaries, personal income by the snap of a finger like magic is running over 12% growth. And I think at the same time, we also need to consider that all these government programs, what are they really? They're, they're only bridge income replacement support mechanisms. That's what they are. They are there to fix a leaky boat. So this is not really stimulus in a classic sense, uh, even though everybody calls it that. Everybody calls it stimulus. It's income replacement. This is not an FDR, New Deal stimulus. And you can think about the New Deal as a very funky deal that created its own levels of resource misallocation, obviously very controversial at the time and today. But the reality is that when you think of the stimulus aspect of the New Deal under FDR, we built the Golden Gate Bridge. We built the Hoover Dam. We built the Lincoln Tunnel. We extended Route 66. We actually paid people <laughs> to go back to work. We didn't pay people not to work. So this is not fiscal stimulus with any future multiplier impact or payback. It's simply government-assisted life support. They certainly have had the upper hand now for the past several months. But any sustainable recovery is completely contingent on a medical breakthrough, either in the form of a vaccine against COVID or at the very least, some form of effective treatment. It's definitely not about reopening the economy because what is going to matter most is demand. There is no renewed hiring cycle that's going to bring the unemployment rate back down without demand. Demand is the key, and that requires confidence. And as I said, confidence that the COVID has been fully beaten, not just partially beaten, because partially beaten means we get what we're seeing right now at the current time, which are 40 states with rising virus cases. And then we have large economies like Florida and like Texas that become hot spots, and even California, which is being forced in a partial lockdown again. And when you talk about these three states, you're talking about 30% of U.S. GDP. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how the reopenings uh, are going to continue uh, to be very spotty. What is going to matter most is the demand side of the economy. That's what you want to focus on. Again, there is no renewed hiring cycle and there's no sustainability, as we're seeing in China already, without demand. Now, I noticed that the Chicago Fed just conducted a survey and found that three quarters of the firms that they polled say the economy is going to need at least a year to fully recover from the pandemic at least a year. Now, there were 670 companies in the poll, half told the Chicago Fed that the recovery is going to take between one and two years to develop. The other half was split between a recovery in less than a year or one that would take more than two years. The report stated, and this is in quotes, many of the small businesses we heard from, especially those 
in the entertainment, tourism, recreation, restaurant, and retail sectors are in danger of financial distress. Many businesses are facing very difficult challenges that are unlikely to go away quickly, end quote. You tally up these sectors, and before the crisis, they supported 32 million jobs in the U.S., or about a third of the private sector workforce. And it looks to me as though perhaps as much as half of them are not going to be going back to their old job. And I'm not sure that many people really understand that amusement parks, airlines, restaurants, hoteliers, they cannot stay in business at 50% or even 75% capacity, especially in the case of restaurants. I think people have to understand that for these sickly sensitive consumer-oriented sectors like restaurants, what do they spend on? They spend 30% on labor, 30% on rent, 30% on food. They have 10% margin. So good luck with partial reopening and social distancing, saving this part of the economy. Uh, Let me ask you something on that point. Uh, If you look at Waze, for example, it looks as to us, at least, that a lot of these companies you're talking about had at least enough from the PPP to get to a certain point. But now you'll get the second wave of people that can't, and those businesses, and they just can't go any longer. And I don't think we've seen that. How how do you feel about that? Well, I think that we've already, you know, the point I was going to make, the very next one addresses that, which is that, um, you know, the PPP is is helping. uh, What the Fed is doing, of course, helping, uh, you know, foster this uh, uh, zombie company staying alive. Uh, the PPP is certainly helping, uh, but these companies, most of them, are, are, are the demand will not be there uh, in 12, 24, 36 months. I mean, these are lifelines. Um, but my view, which I'll go through in more depth, is that we've had a fundamental impairment of demand for a lot of these industries uh, for a long period of time. So uh, what the government is doing is greasing the wheels and buying time. Uh, But the Chamber of Commerce, Ted, has already found that 25%. So this is asked to come down to how come the PPP didn't address this? The Chamber of Commerce has already reported as of now, since the pandemic started, 25% of small businesses have already shut their doors. Let me ask you on that point of defaults with these private businesses, do you think that that, that's in the the bank? in the bank's balance sheets right now in terms of uh, really non, non-public non banks as well as public banks? A lot of the defaults that are taking place are in the public sphere. Don't forget that, you know, in this, in this cycle, uh, the banks were bypassed because they were treated as regulated utilities uh, by the authorities coming out of the crisis um, over a decade ago. So, you know, it's just like in the mortgage business, um, you know, in 05, 06, 07, if you had a pulse... All you had to you just that's all you needed to get a mortgage. Uh, we had we had the least credit worthy borrowers being able to go in public markets and raise money. It was really uh, the the bubble. This cycle was not in bank lending per se. Uh, it was in business borrowing in the public markets. And who's holding that bag? Uh, well, uh, who's holding that bag? Who, who the Fed has bailed out? Credit hedge funds that levered themselves. Uh, insurance companies, pension funds. Who's holding on to the bag? Of all this, um, shall we say, uh, you know, we hit, hit, hit a situation where half of the investment grade market was triple B, one notch away from being downgraded. So the Fed felt compelled to have the backstop fall on angels. Well, think about that for a second. But who's holding on to a lot of this debt? Insurance companies, pension funds, credit hedge funds. So it was really that aspect, what you call the buy side of the uh, business uh, that got bailed out this time. But that's where a lot of that debt's been held. It's not really a banking issue. Do you think that uh, impacts uh, private equity in terms of, you know, they they can hide behind the numbers because they don't really have to show real-time returns uh, because there's no bids for the businesses necessarily, but don't you think they're part of that as well? Uh, Yeah, of course. I mean, look, it's a much more opaque industry, but I'm not going to differentiate between private and and public equity. Um, They're both ultimately uh, correlated with something called risk on. And that's what the Fed wants. The Fed wants a risk on marketplace. Uh, so private equity is more opaque. It's a, uh, 
uh, a really different um, segment where, you know, you're basically willing as an investor to uh, pay an illiquidity premium to be invested, uh, but you're still investing uh, in the in corporate America. I mean, the question always is, at what price? Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, private equity, uh, you know, the situation there is that they juice their returns through tremendous leverage. And that might be one of the critical differences and why they probably had a lot more difficulty and therefore got bailed out um, by multiples by what the Fed has done. Um, because all these leveraged poor managers of risk are the ones that got bailed out the most. So I guess you could throw private equity over public equity managers in that realm, absolutely. But the key there for the private guys, and the same thing for the credit hedge funds, <clears throat> and hedge funds in general, uh, and I'm not talking about market neutral hedge funds, I'm talking about that what, where do the returns come from? When you're hearing about people having spectacular returns this cycle, whether it's public or private equity, and especially in private equity, it was because of the L word, leverage. For all the talk about, oh, that there were no bad actors this cycle. Yes, yes, there were bad actors. We had actually the mother of all leverage cycles when it actually comes to the corporate sector. It wasn't about the mortgage market and mezzanine CDOs this time around. So, so with the backdrop that you've been speaking about, uh, most of the investors that are watching this would want to say, so David, where would you be putting your money over the next three years or so? Well, you know, there's a, uh, you know, the, the point I was trying to make before uh, is that uh, this is not business as usual. Uh, and I think that we have to be really looking at this, notwithstanding what the policy response has been, uh, in the context of a depression as opposed to just a plain vanilla recession. And what makes a depression different um, then a recession is a recession is really just a dent in GDP. You tend to forget about it. Whereas depressions uh, tend to um, have a, uh, a more permanent impact uh, on people's behavior. Uh, so I think that's the one thing that we have here is that uh, we have a, a learning lesson as to how people behaved, how the pandemic and the lockdowns, uh, you know, how they had an impact on on people's behavior, both in their commercial life uh, and in their personal life. Uh, I actually found it um, you know, very interesting as to what people have been spending their money on uh, you know, throughout this whole situation. And it was interesting that you, know, you had bicycles, you had auto repair, you had cloud computing, uh, you know, wiring up your home, for example. The stay-at-home theme to me is going to be a very uh, enduring theme. Uh, and that has all sorts of negative implications, say, for auto travel, uh, maybe travel of all kinds. Certainly, it's negative for, for office real estate. Um, but there's a budding bull market in, uh, in, in wiring your home and internet services on delivery services. Uh, and then I think we have to take a look at what else do we know? We know that 53% of American households went into this uh, situation uh, with not enough savings to get them through three months of a crisis. So I think there's going to be a greater appreciation on savings, a greater appreciation on cash, a greater appreciation of liquidity, I think, in both the personal and the business sector. So it's telling me that you want to focus on a theme of people uh, doing what with their money in terms of spending on what they need, not what they want. Spending on what they need, not what they want. Do you know that one of the biggest sellers during the whole pandemic has been bread makers? Uh, and this is, again, one of the things why restaurants aren't going to survive is people have learned how to cook. Look at the demand, the ongoing demand for eggs. Look at the, what the price of eggs. There's certainly inflation in eggs. People learned how to cook. They learned how to sew. Uh, one of the fastest growing components weren't, weren't autos uh, during the pandemic, but they were retail auto parts. Uh, and they were um, clothing repair, and they were uh, uh, home improvement uh, and, um, and gardening supplies. Uh, so you want to invest around the home body economy. Um, the challenge right now for me for the equity market is that the stuff that I do like, those companies with utility-like characteristics that are more in the growth area, um, are just trading at nosebleed multiples. But yeah, look, these stocks have come down in the past. Uh, they'll come down again, and you'll have a, if you're patient and disciplined and have resolve, you'll be able to buy them 
at better prices because uh, nothing's going to go up uh, forever. Uh, buying these stocks with 20-year PE multiples to me is just uh, rather egregious. So, uh, uh, Dave, you know, uh, David, on that same point, uh, you have in the past liked, uh, liked gold and to a certain degree oil at these lows. How do you feel about that now? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the problem with oil is that we, we saw already what happens when left to its own devices, you get a negative price. And then OPEC comes and cuts out, but at its greatest rate in 30 years, and the oil price pops to $40. So, I mean, do you really want to invest in something with such dramatic volatility, where in a matter of months you go from a negative futures price to $40 uh, based on OPEC plus? Um, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to be in a casino. Uh, gold is something different. Gold, and gold, look, gold is gold is going up in every currency terms. Not just gold, but silver, which just broke above twenty dollars an ounce for the first time in four years. We'll just talk talk about precious metals. The thing about gold is that um, it is really just a great hedge against all the central bank alchemy that has totally distorted, um, you know, financial assets. And of course, gold, gold, gold's production is running at what, Ted? 1% per year. That's what makes gold special. It's not just you can go back to the Bible and read about gold. You don't read about current fiat currency uh, in, the, in the Bible. Gold production is stable. That's what makes it special. That's why we used to have the gold standard that everything else was measured against. It's because it was production year in, year out is stable at roughly 1% per year. Now, we can try and estimate the demand and what the dowry season in India looks like in one year or what ETF inflows look like another year, but it's the production function of gold, its stability that is so powerful. So at a time when the U.S. money supply is running at a 30% annual rate and gold's running at a 1% annual rate, it's an absolute no-brainer that just looking at the relative supply curves why gold is in this very quiet, very quiet, slow-moving bull market. It's not making the front page of the paper like the tech stocks are. It's in a bona fide, after a six-year basement period, there's no more bona fide bull market right now. And I would throw the NASDAQ 100 in there because there is no other bona fide bull market than, than bull, bullion. It's a matter of how you want to own it. Do you want to own the physical gold or do you want to own the uh, producer stocks? I'd say both. Um, but I'd say that I'd say that I'd say that gold I'd say I'd say gold is in a long term. Don't forget, we're still in a global deflationary gap. Can you imagine what happens when we actually go to the other side, Ted, and get the actual inflation? Can you imagine what gold does the day that money velocity stops going down? Can you imagine the day where, because of weak productivity growth, a sclerotic, structurally high unemployment rate? Uh, means that demand stabilizes and we get supply side. We get actually stagflation. By the way, that's in our future. Gold is the best hedge. Gold, real estate, by the way. I mean, you, I mean so gold, uh, gold is actually let you know, gold has replaced the 30-year treasury uh, as my top conviction call. And what do you uh, think about uh, time? You, you think that has uh, two to five years to go or what? You have a number of thought on that? I'd say... I'd say that that's certainly not going to be as long as five years. It could be, I'd say, two to three years. And I know people will say to me, well, geez, that's like, you know, it's like talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, dessert when we're still serving the appetizer. But, you know, it's not really, you know, I'm going to say that it's not, it's not around the corner, but it's out there. Uh, and so I think you want to be thinking about uh, the next two plus years of what stagflation, which is weak growth, structurally high unemployment, and then inflation starts to go up. By the way, by the way, this was the situation we had in the United States from 1934 to 1936. So you wanna be thinking about that. Uh, and it means, you know, consumer staples, good place to be, healthcare and the equity market, a good place to be. You wanna be really screening for oligopolies, monopolies, uh, companies that uh, benefit from uh, uh, high fixed costs, low variable costs, where there's barriers to entry. You almost want to not even do sector by sector by sector, but actually screen for those micro characteristics. Um, but real estate, there'll be a great hedge. And precious metals will be a great hedge. You'd probably find that industrial commodities in general will be a very good inflation hedge. Just basically take out the 1970s playbook and you'll be just fine. 
Interesting you asked that about, because uh, one of the questions that came in was, do you think we're following in the footsteps of Japan? Absolutely. 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 And I, I'll say right now that um, uh, we are following, there's, there's no question. Look, look, you know, Japan was one of the first to start uh, the Bank of Japan going into corporate credit, the Bank of Japan buying equity ETFs. I mean, their market's still 50% below uh, its previous peak. Well, it peaked, uh, it peaked in 1989, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, so and it's, it's gone through, been down there for it's gone through peaks. It's gone through peaks and valleys. I mean, but yes, the uh, um, I think that we follow Japan. I think the world has actually followed Japan. Look, people say to me, well, where's the proof of that? Where's the proof of that? Look where interest rates are. Look where interest rates are. Do you need anything more to see the front end at zero? Do you see negative real yields out the curve? Um, that's all you need to know. And I could tell you that you know the world's become more Japanese. And what got Japanese in the trouble of, and, and why their economy turned sclerotic and why they couldn't get out of their own way and why there was this ongoing fragility and recessions every three or four years was because there's just too much debt. There's just too much debt. I do think that we're going to be into a period of uh, elevated savings rates. You know, before the pandemic, the savings rate, broadly speaking, was 7%. Um, you're asking me, you know, what is the steady state savings rate going to be uh, for the next, say, 10 years? I think it's going to be very close to 20%. Uh, and think about what that means. It means it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world unless you're a retailer. Because uh, we live in a very consumerism economy. The U.S. is the only economy in the world where consumption is, is 70% of GDP. Uh, you know, that number probably comes down. So I think the spending saving equation is going to be changing. So I think the savings rate is going to be double to triple what the norm was. That is going to come out of consumption, which is GDP, which is why we're going to be in a very weak growth environment for a long, prolonged period of time. I think so. So that's what I was saying before. People will still be buying toothpaste, okay? Um, but they might not be buying uh, as many electronic uh, gadgets. They won't be going as many trips. Uh, they won't be going to as many theme park visits. Uh, and I'm not saying that they wouldn't with some pent-up demand, but I, that's what I was saying before. You want to focus on what people need, not what they want. It would tell me that we'd be in a pervasive outperformance of consumer staples writ large over consumer discretionary. You know, David, uh I, I think people forget about this. I know uh, my wife and females I know and males I know, your, most of your clothing is just hanging in a closet. I mean, you know, they're really not spending as much uh, on that sort of thing. There's so many things that affects that people don't think about uh, that where they used to just, just go down to a store and walk in. Uh, and so we see a, a lot of that. Or if you go to one of the, even the high-end stores, you have to have someone meet you at the front door and take you in personally, that sort of thing. That, sh that has a big impact on spending. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think that um, I, I would say that at least a third of the popula working population uh, will not be going back to the office uh, the way they were before. Uh, I think this, uh, this work at home, um, is here to stay. Uh, the homebody economy uh, is here to stay, lockdown or no lockdown. Uh, might not work for everybody and not every single business will allow it, but at the margin, it's gonna be a very powerful force. Um, well, you know, if, if that's the case, uh, you're not gonna have to go buy um, clothes for work at the same rate that you did previously. Uh, so this is hugely negative uh, from a, say, a, a, a work, uh, related um, apparel point of view. I said before, it also means the implications for transit, public transit, uh, what it means for commercial real estate as these leases come due. That This to me is going to be a huge long-term problem for the economy uh, is office real estate in densely populated urban areas, including New York. Um, and uh, that's where I think you'll also see a lot of bankruptcies uh, and defaults uh, still coming down the pike even past uh, the period we're in right now. So a lot of very fundamental changes uh, taking place. Now, David, you mentioned uh, real estate, and it's interesting because it's sort of a bifurcated look. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it would be a good hedge on inflation, but then you mentioned about uh, in the downtown areas, in the areas where 
commercial and say people are trying to get out, you know, get other places. Uh, what part of the real estate market do you think would do better? I think that I want to be um, involved in uh, residential. Uh, and I think that the trend will be towards single family. Uh, so I think single family and non-urban areas, uh, those will be uh, where the future trend is going to be. Because we come out of this, once again, learning what? Learning how important space is. Uh, learning how important, especially for young families, uh, either a balcony or even better yet, a backyard. Uh, and what we know, what we know is that um, interest rates are, the Fed's already told you, uh, interest rates are not going anywhere for the next several years. So insofar as you have any job security and income security, your financing costs uh, are going to remain close to zero. I mean, mortgage rates are already sliced through 3%. They're going to probably go even lower. Uh, and so affordability is not going to be an issue. Um, it's going to be really on, uh, you know, uh, where it is that you want to live and what sort of housing unit. You already saw it, by the way, by the way, very early signs of this trend uh, emerged in the latest housing start number uh, for June. Uh, this trend away, multifamily uh, permits and starts are in a downtrend. And this is interesting because, you know, most of the housing bull market uh, from 2010 to 2019 was this, you know, buy for rent uh, multifamily theme. Uh, I think now that mean reverts towards uh, uh, rural uh, suburban areas uh, geared towards uh, geared towards um, single family, and I'd say you know low cost bungalows. That is going to be the future, and that's where the demand's going to be. So uh, the last question we had was uh, sort of a, a question for you, thinking uh, I guess a bit longer term, and the question was. Are you optimistic on the U.S. for the long term? Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, I think you have to be optimistic uh, in the long term in the U.S. Uh, the question is, you know, how long is the long term? Um, so I don't know if the long term is 20, 30 or 40 years. Uh, you know, you could have asked that question in the 1970s. And then we had to wait for Ronald Reagan. Um, I am bullish on the U.S. for the longer term, but, you know, I, I really wish that uh, we could get back to uh, the sort of political leadership we had uh, in decades past. Uh, you know, uh, where is that FDR, for example, um, who obviously controversial, but fought the Great Depression and then fought World War II? And where's the Harry Truman? Uh, you know, where's the uh, where's 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 the Ronald Reagan? Um, so. It really starts on the politics. Uh, and um, I think that the problem is really defining the long term because we're going to have to go through uh, a period now of debating uh, how we're going to pay for this mess. Who's going to pay for this mess? Uh, and the mess in the United States in terms of fiscal and Fed is much greater than it is anywhere else because the, the U.S. wasn't as prepared uh, the U.S. did not have automatic stabilizers like other countries did. So, you know, when you're taking a look at who really had to blow their brains out the most on fiscal, you know, uh, not even stimulus. There's nothing stimulus here. It's an income replacement plan from the government sector to the personal sector. Uh, and then we have to have this debate as to who's going to pay for this. What's going to happen with the Fed's balance sheet? I mean, the United States uh, has earned the right. I mean, 70 percent of the world's reserves are in U.S. dollars. The U.S. is. Uh, not just the world's uh, wealthiest country and most powerful country, uh, but it's the world's reserve currency. <laughs> so, you know, only in the relative game, when there's no other entity to replace it. Now, how do we go through this? How do we go through this uh, balance sheet expansion on the Fed, the Fed monetizing U.S. government debts, and we retain the world's reserve currency status, which has been hugely positive for the United States. That, 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 that's on my mind. But uh, I would say this much. I am long-term bullish on the U.S. But if you ask me right here, right now, based on which area of the world is being re-rated more positively uh, from a growth standpoint, uh, an asset and currency standpoint, uh, I'd say uh, we got to punch through our comfort zone and start looking at Europe more seriously right now. So 
in that vein, in that vein, you uh, mentioned uh, you mean you're you would be looking at Europe in terms of investment. Yes. Yes. Okay. The other thing I was going to ask you that brought up, uh, which will wind up here, but uh, talking about uh, looking at uh, the leadership that you just mentioned, do you think the stock market now uh, has uh, built in a change in leadership that's coming in November? Or do you think they think it's business as usual? Well, you know, uh, we wrote a report on this a few weeks ago where we found that the markets only start to look at elections. Uh, after Labor Day, which is exactly what happened in 2016. Um, and um, and so uh, I think right now it's the, the markets are they're thinking, although uh, Trump is way behind in the polls, I think there's this prevailing view that these poll results uh, are not permanent. We'll wait and see what happens in September. Uh, there's still the debates, and we know that Trump is a great uh, debater and campaigner. Uh, of course, it'll the fact that... Uh, It'll be done virtual, uh, doesn't help them so much. But, um, you know, a lot of things can change, as we've seen before. I, I don't I don't think that I don't think that um, you can just say that the 2016, these were fake polls. Um, you know, Hillary was on her way to win until the Comey bombshell, really a week before the election. Um, but, you know, uh, if you go back to 1980, uh, uh, Carter had a huge lead uh, over Reagan. Uh, going into the debates just before the November 1980 election. And it shows you how important the debate was because because uh, Reagan just did phenomenally well. Uh, and uh, next thing you know, he's president. So I think that, um, uh, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I, you know, Trump's behind by, say, 15 points in the average nationwide poll, I think people think that's going to tighten up. And I think they're looking at Joe Biden. I mean, it's not if it was Bernie Sanders, I think it'd be one thing. But I think people are looking at uh, Joe Biden as being, uh, you know, much more centrist. So I don't think they're as worried. Um, nothing is really going to get legislated that's crazy uh, without the Senate. And the Senate is usually a pretty stable body. So, you know, it, it might be far less uh, of an impact. The Joe Biden presidency might be viewed, even though he might at some point reverse part of the corporate tax cuts. Who knows when that's going to happen? Um, I think the market, I think the market could live with a Biden presidency. And so that's why it's probably taking it in stride. But the proof of the pudding will be what happens after Labor Day. Well, you probably saw this this morning of what he came out with on basically uh, removing the 1031 exchange on real estate, which would have a really big impact, uh, I think, on the commercial real estate market in terms of what it's been in the past. And so we'll see. But he came out and said that that would be one of the ways he would raise uh, $775 billion. Right. And right. you know, we'll, we'll find out. Well, listen, David, uh, I know we've, uh, we've gone on here, but there's so many things that so many people would always like to ask of you. And for all the people out there watching today, you'll see on the streamer that David has uh, so kindly uh, given a 30-day free trial to his service and he's, he writes daily, he writes extremely well, and I think you'll find everything that, that, that he does uh, will be helpful to you. So he'll give you that free trial, and then if you wanna take it from there on out, you're certainly welcome to, but David, I wanna thank you, and, and we look forward, hopefully, uh, in 21, to have you back live again, for sure. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to make that I'm going to make that part of my forecast. That's how badly I want it. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much, David, and we'll uh, we'll certainly see you another time. Thank you. Great, Ted. Thanks you again. Bet.